our break, I think, and I hope most of our CTF panelists and commenters are back on the call. Um, so we are now at the section of our meeting for public comments and discussion. Um, for panelists who are not speaking, keep your microphone off and I'm going to introduce two commenters that we have um, here in advance. Uh, these are manufacturers, and I would like um, each of them to declare uh, any potential conflicts of interest before delivering their remarks. Uh, the first is Dustin Little from AstraZeneca, and then we have Jeffrey Peterson from Amgen. Um, and after each of their comments, we will have time for questions from uh, CTAF and ICER staff. So um, at this point, let me go ahead and turn over the uh, microphone to Dustin Little. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, I'm an employee of AstraZeneca. And uh, at AstraZeneca, I'm the clinical lead for Roxadustat. On behalf of AstraZeneca and our colleagues at Fibrogen, I appreciate the opportunity to comment on the evidence report for the assessment of Roxadustat. Roxadustat is a first-in-class oral hypoxia-inducible proleol hydroxylase inhibitor that's based on Nobel Prize-winning science that has been developed for adult patients with anemia of chronic kidney disease on and not on dialysis. The initial quote from the patient and Dr. Pearson's initial remarks really resonated with me in terms of my uh, past experience as a nephrologist seeing patients every day. One of the challenges that my patients and I faced was limited innovation in the development of novel therapies for CKD and the complications of CKD. This was particularly true in CKD anemia, an area that has seen little advancement in over 30 years. As was discussed, anemia affects nearly all patients with dialysis-dependent CKD and is also common in patients with severe dialysis-independent CKD. ESAs, or, or erythropoiesis stimulating agents, are the cornerstones of CKD anemia management. However, their parenteral route of administration can present a barrier for some patients and patient populations. And they don't address impaired iron utilization, which is really a major contributor to the pathophysiology of CKD anemia. Due to this, ESA-treated CKD patients frequently require exogenous iron administration, which is often administered intravenously. ESA use is particularly infrequent in dialysis-independent CKD, and rates of transfusion have increased following ESA label updates where lower hemoglobin targets were recommended. I, I wanna emphasize how important reduction in transfusion risk is, especially for many patients with advanced CKD who might be otherwise transplants for, uh, or candidates, excuse me, for transplantation. As was mentioned before, transfusion can reduce the likelihood of transplantation and increased access to transplantation is really, really critical because as we know, transplantation is associated with improved survival and increased quality of life. And additionally, and unfortunately, tr transplant disparities exist in the United States. In particular, black patients are half as likely to undergo kidney transplantation despite being four times as likely to have chronic kidney disease. Roxadustat is an oral medication that induces endogenous erythropoietin production and increases iron utilization, thereby reducing the requirement for intravenous iron. Our global phase three development program for US regulatory submission is one of the largest CKD anemia programs ever conducted. It consisted of more than 8,000 patients who were treated in six pivotal trials and included more than 1,500 patients incident to dialysis a vulnerable and historically understudied population. AstraZeneca and Fibrogen support patient-centric value assessments that take into consideration innovative therapies that address unmet medical need. However, we feel that ICER's analysis is not yet complete. As mentioned, the analysis was based on publicly available data at the time of the review, and the pivotal trials and pooled analyses were not yet published in peer-reviewed medical journals at the time of ICER's analysis. Some results have been published in the interim, including the pooled incident dialysis re results. And actually just yesterday, the Olympus trial, the largest placebo controlled NDD trial in the program uh, was published. This, in our opinion, precluded a fully informed examination of Roxadustat and impacted ICER's ability to conduct their analyses. This is apparent in ICER's value, uh, evaluation of value in the dialysis dependent population. 
To assess mortality, ICER used results from a meta-analysis that they performed, which yielded an all-cause mortality risk ratio point estimate of 1.05, with a 95% confidence interval crossing one. However, the pooled all-cause mortality hazard ratio for roxadustat versus epoe and alpha in the three pivotal dialysis dependent studies has a point estimate of less than one. And these full results will soon be publicly available as they've been accepted for publication in a major peer-reviewed medical journal. Additionally, the Roxadustat Global Phase III program was designed to enable a rigorous prospective assessment of cardiovascular safety for Roxadustat compared to ESA and incident dialysis patients. We consider this population to be highly clinically relevant, and we consider it notable that Roxadustat treated patients had a 30% lower risk of MACE and a 34% lower risk of MACE+. Plus. In addition to the limitations above, the analysis by, by ICER did not consider the pending guidance on eligibility and re reimbursement for Roxadustat via the TADAPA payment system. And we feel that this limits um, ICER's evaluation, uh, the, the, value, the applicability of um, ICER's evaluation of value during the TADAPA period. Uh, to, to wrap up, overall, we believe that Roxadustat offers value as an oral treatment that reduces the risk of transfusion decreases the requirement for intravenous iron, and effectively treats anemia in dialysis-dependent and dialysis-independent patients with consistent efficacy across subgroups that persisted over mean treatment durations with Roxadustat of over 1.5 years. Effectively treating CKD anemia and lower transfu lowering transfusion risk with an oral therapy that does not require parenteral administration in healthcare settings, and that decreases the need for IV iron, should minimize disruption of work and family life for patients and caregivers, especially in dialysis independent and home dialysis settings. Briefly, this may be particularly important for historically disadvantaged and underserved communities who may be more likely to have employment instability, increased caregiver responsibilities for family members and decreased flexibility with work schedules. In summary, Roxadustat is an innovative therapy with a distinct mechanism of action that is administered orally and that offers advantages over currently available treatments in a disease area with high unmet medical need and little advancements in over 30 years. We're gonna call it at that, but thank All you right. very much. Those are perfect comments. And um, I'd like to open up to uh, CTAF or ICER for responses or questions. Um, this is uh, David Rand. I, I'd be interested in understanding your comment about uh, the pooled all-cause mortality of the three dialysis independent CKD versus placebo uh, being less than one uh, when correctly pooled. Presumably you're talking about a hazard ratio there. And as per my comments, are we talking about a hazard ratio for all-cause mortality treatment emergent mortality at 28 days after drug therapy? Or are we talking about this including off therapy, all cause mortality that we viewed as less useful. Uh, Dr. Rind, let me let me clarify that um, the the our point estimate for the hazard ratio for all cause mortality uh, for the dialysis independent population is uh, 1.06 with a 95% confidence interval of 0 0.91 to 1.23. The confidence interval point estimate for mortality that I mentioned uh, was the dialysis dependent population. The, the methods that we use for pooling, the dialysis dependent population, pardon me, the, the methods that we use for pooling the results uh, in the NDD population are methods that we agree to with major regulatory agencies and methods that are, that are well established. We, we believe that these important results should be communicated in labels and in peer reviewed publications and regarding publications, the NDD uh, pooled data is under revision in a major medical journal. Two of the three pivotal NDD uh, trials have been published and the third has been accepted for publication. And I'm sorry, so you were saying that the pooled estimate on mortality in the dialysis dependent population then is less than one, including Pyrenees and looking at treatment emergent within 28 days, or again, are we talking about pooling longer? And I, I'm, it's great that with the regulatory agencies, they also asked you, I'm sure, to look at long-term mortality because that would be an important safety signal. 
but it would dilute an effect of a therapy that was hazardous. So I, with Pyrenees, 28 day treatment emergent hazard ratio is less than one. So Pyrenees, as you know, is one of, is a dialysis dependent study. Right, I thought, we were, we, I thought you had said I, we should be talking dialysis dependent. Am I, have I got that wrong? So let's talk about the dialysis dependent. Good. Yep, yep. You mentioned a point estimate of less than one and I thought I heard you say, um, I wanted to clarify which population that, that we were talking about. Um, just, just to clarify, our dialysis independent hazard ratio point estimate is 1.06 with an upper bound of 95% confidence interval of 1.23 and a confidence interval that crosses one. So we consider there to be no difference in risk for all-cause mortality um, or MACE or MACE plus in the NDD population compared to placebo. Uh, regarding, regarding the dialysis dependent population, uh, Dr. Rind, we believe that the pooled assessment of the three pivotal trials that have a similar design with the single comparator of EPOIT and alpha provide the best assessment of cardiovascular safety. Uh, the point estimate for the hazard ratio of that analysis is 0.96. The, the Pyrenees trial by itself was not powered to, to uh, assess for mortality, to assess cardiovascular safety, and we believe that that should be evaluated separately. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, Elizabeth Murphy, question. Yes, and sorry, I'm still not clear. Sorry for all the back and forth. Does it, does the, so it doesn't include Pyrenees, but does it look just at 28 days after, or does it, extend longer, the quote, the estimate you gave. Yeah, Dr. Murphy, I, I, this is one of the reasons why I think it's difficult to have this analysis at this point in time without all the publications out there. I mean, we, we really think that the methods that we use for these trials Sorry to be, interrupt for one second. Yep. Just yes or no is fine. I understand there's more analyses coming out, but you're quoting us a number. And does it include 28 days or does it include everything? I think that just so that we know what number you're talking about right now. Oh, yes, ma'am. That's an on-treatment analysis. Okay. Okay. Um, Elizabeth, any further points or questions? No, thanks. Okay. Um, I don't see any other raised hands. Um, I'll ask a very brief question. Hopefully we can just uh, keep a, a brief answer. I was curious, you had mentioned, of course, the um, representation of um, Black and Latinx patients in the CKD uh, population. And could you um, tell us about representation of those groups in the trials? I hadn't seen that. And, and is it equivalent to or proportional to the CKD population as a whole? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Fox. So these were in international uh, uh, programs. Um, uh, however, we did have around 1,000 black patients uh, overall in the pivotal program and around, around uh, 1,500 Latin American patients in, in the pivotal program. And we've done uh, subgroup analyses um, you know, as expected and, and we don't see um, any notable differences in efficacy or safety in, in, in those or any subgroups. And, and other than the absolute number, what about uh, in terms of percent of the subjects? So those data, I've, I've got that. Um, so overall, the, about, out of about 8,000 patients, uh, around 1,000 patients were black and out of about 8,000 patients, around 1,500 patients were Latin, uh, were Latin American. And um, in, the, in the US, in, in the US patients, which constituted around 30% of patients overall, the, distri the distribution of, of ethnicities and race were similar to the overall population with around 30 to 40% of, of patients being black in the United States, off the top of my head. Thank you. Okay, we will move on to our uh, second uh, public commenter, uh, Jeffrey Peterson from Amgen. Jeffrey I believe Peterson. you should. You can, you, can you hear me? And I, I hope you'll be able to see me shortly. Uh, we do hear you. 
Yes. And there's a timer there for you to follow as well. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm an Amgen employee and my name is Dr. Jeffrey Peterson. I'm a nephrologist by training with 40 years of experience in evaluating and prescribing therapeutic options for CKD patients. I'm currently the global development lead for ESAs at Amgen. Prior to Amgen, I was a professor at Stanford University where I cared for patients with the kidney disease for over 25 years. I was part of history in 1989 when almost immediately following the introduction of epigen into clinical practice, the outpatient transfusion rate among US hemodialysis patients fell sharply. Over the following 30 years, we have come to improve our understanding of the benefits and risks of ESAs and how to best use them in our patients. This is based on science, randomized controlled trials, labeled revisions, reimbursement, real-world data, and our extensive experience at Amgen. Our global cumulative post-marketing patient exposure from launch of Epigen and RNFs for all indications are estimated to exceed 9 million and 8 million patient years respectively, which has added further to understand ESAs. We are excited about innovations, but there are some criti critical areas that we request the panel to consider as related to this assessment. First, for efficacy and safety, key drivers in the analysis are still inconclusive despite two recent publications in January. The ISA report states Roxadusat provides an oral option for treating anemia related to CKD and reduces the need for IVI and, and highlights uncertainties about Roxadusat's impact on cardiovascular safety compared to ESAs. In those two recent publications, one of them in the incident dialysis population and the second in the not on dialysis population with an accompanying commentary further adds to the substantial uncertainties in the long-term cost effective analysis. I will make some points from that commentary. The publication stated that there are additional aspects from these trials that await detailed analysis and reporting. 40% of the not on dialysis patients were iron deficient at baseline. Oral iron was encouraged, but administering intravenous iron was considered rescue therapy. Regarding efficacy, Roxadustat proved to be non-inferior to epigen with different protocolized dosing algorithms in the two arms in the incident dialysis population. The publication importantly states regarding cardiovascular safety. Subgroup analysis of the incident dialysis population must be considered hypothesis generating and by no means definitive. Lastly, longer follow-up of real world patients is necessary to learn about any uncommon or learn to long-term adverse or beneficial effects. With regards to cost, we just don't know if Roxadustat saves costs or adds cost. One of the biggest drivers for ISA's dialysis dependent model is that the expected cost saving calculated the result of higher mortality rates for dialysis patients on Roxadustat. Those cost savings in the model are largely attributable to more dialysis patients dying, thus no longer incurring health costs. Improving and identified treatments of value should not lie in reduced healthcare costs due to patients dying, but with improved patient outcomes. In my experience, CKD patients are some of the most challenging patients to take care of. One of those challenges is when to initiate dialysis, a life-changing event. At Stanford, I cared for a patient with severe kidney disease at a time when new information on the benefits and risks for ESAs were emerging. He had anemia and wanted to remain active and avoid dialysis for as long as possible. After discussing with him, I prescribed RNS and his anemia improved. Despite his marginal kidney function, he had two years of additional active social life on Aranus treatment before he started dialysis. 
Therefore, in order to find the optimal outcome for patients, we ask the panel to consider critical issues, some of which I've outlined when deliberating on the value of these important treatment options, taking the evidence and areas of uncertainty into account. Thank you to ISA and the panel for providing this platform to discuss the therapeutic options for patients with anemia due to CKD. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, responses or comments or questions from CTAF or ICER. I am not seeing any hands raised so far. Unless I'm missing them, please then you can shout out, but I'm not seeing any hands raised at this point. Yeah, looks like we can move forward. Okay. Um, well, uh, that is um, all we have for our um, planned commenters. And I think we're catching back up and uh, Steve, if you agree, then we could um, close this yes. uh, portion right now and move on to our lunch break. Yep, let me just frame again what's coming ahead. So we'll reconvene at 11.50 uh, Pacific time. Folks on the West Coast are gonna be eating lunch early, folks on the East Coast a little late. And we'll come back together at that point um, to start the uh, further deliberation on the evidence, um, taking into consideration the comments um, that we've just heard. And uh, again, following that, we'll move to the policy roundtable. So everybody uh, enjoy your break. We will see you back at 11.50 Pacific or 2.50 PM Eastern time.